looking at providing a disclosure of origin requirement, mandatory disclosure of origin requirement for uh, genetic resources and associated traditional knowledge. There were concerns, particularly in the African group, about lacking the ability even to require disclosure of origin of traditional knowledge, traditional cultural expressions, or genetic resources that could be used in creating a protectable design. While design is an area that is not really harmonized, not seen as widely as important as some of the other areas, it is important and it's becoming more important. Just examples to help illustrate why inserting a permissive uh, ability to require disclosure of origin was important to a number of, of delegations. It was started by the African group, but supported by a number of delegations. We see a lot about cultural misappropriation these days, the fashion law, and the thing with design protection, as in other areas of intellectual property, the subject matter has expanded. So there's a U.S. design patent for Adinkra um, symbols from the Adinkra, Ghanaian Adinkra alphabet, Basoto blankets. Um, that is very important to the people in Lesotho, and yet we see Louis Vuitton creating a shirt. And there can be different kinds of, of harms that can come from this misappropriation. And whether it's registered or not, there can be harms. Thank you so much for inviting me, Sean. Um, also to, to participate, to be here with you. Um, this is a provision that has gotten pushback, lots of pushback since 2014. Um, and sometimes the discussions have been so intense. <laughs> um, and Professor Ruth Akadaji and I together, uh, 2014, 2015, 2016, defending this um, provision. So there is no need for a definition of TK or TCEs in this treaty. Industrial design is not defined in the basic proposal. What is an industrial design? It's left to national law and national laws do differ on how they de define what an industrial design is. Um, to bring it very close to home, in our new WIPO Treaty on Intellectual Property, Genetic Resources and Associated Traditional Knowledge, which has a mandatory disclosure of origin requirement, there is no definition of traditional knowledge. It is left to national law. And if we don't have it there, then we certainly don't need it in the DLT where all that we're seeking is a permissive disclosure that countries who want to be able to require disclosure for TK, TCEs, GR be able to do so. Okay. All right, so Article 3 started out and is still intended to be a closed list. And the idea is that it should make it easier for applicants to obtain protection in multiple countries if they know the things that they're going to have to provide and that it's not that many things. And, and this is in the explanatory notes. The explanatory notes have now been separated from the basic proposal, but I encourage you to go back and look at the explanatory notes to see what the intention is in relation to these different provisions, because um, it's actually very enlightening. So the African group proposal in its current formulation was introduced in 2015. Um, it was a slightly different formulation in 2014, and then Alt-B in 2019. So we have these two alternatives now um, where in this closed list, something that could be required is a disclosure that could be required is a disclosure of the origin or source of traditional cultural expressions, traditional knowledge or biological genetic resources utilized or incorporated in the industrial design. And then with Alt-B, um, an indication of prior application or registration or other information of which the applicant is aware that is relevant to the eligibility for registration of the industrial design. So some problems with alternative B, it's likely to generate battles on what is relevant to the eligibility for registration, okay? And eligibility sounds like it's going to substance. We normally think about eligibility for designs, and again, it varies by country, but novelty, distinctiveness, ornamentality, 
Those are the requirements for eligibility. If you link this to having to be a requirement for eligibility, then you've got to explain, well, how does it relate to eligibility and what is it that actually has to be shown? And you're, you're now having to make it a substantive requirement, whereas it may be preferable for it to simply be a formal requirement, um, which is as how it is framed in the treaty that we adopted in May. It's, it's not putting any burden on the IP office to verify the accuracy of the disclosed information you know, you just want to have that information there. So not necessarily desirable to tie it to eligibility. Eligibility is a much more substantive provision. Having that footnote doesn't really help because that's still premised on eligibility for registration. And, and that's opening up a whole can of worms and creating the possibility and what I think is a likelihood um, of considerable pressure on many developing countries to not incorporate uh, disclosure of origin as a requirement for eligibility in their national laws. It, it's, it's not there now, um, and it would be difficult, and they would actually have to, in order to disclose, you would have to make it a requirement for eligibility in order to come within Article 3 if Alt B is adopted. You would have to change your law to make disclosure of origin a requirement for eligibility. And that's, I, I don't know any countries that want to do that. And, and I, would, I wouldn't really um, advise that. Whereas alternative A, it's very clear. It's saying that countries have the space to require disclosure of origin if they so desire for it, GRs, TK, TCEs. A country can choose to just have a formal requirement um, or if they want to make it part of the substantive law, that's, that's up to the country. But policy space here is really important. A lot of countries have not paid a lot of attention to design rights. It hasn't been that important. And um, there are so many innovations happening in this area, new ways in which design rights are being used in conjunction with utility patents um, and the possibility of contributing to misappropriation of cultural and genetic resources. All right, so some concerns that the African group had and why that provision was inserted originally. Most design registration regimes that I'm aware of are formal systems in the sense that there's no substantive examination. You meet the requirements, you get your registration. My husband and I started a, a new company recently um, and, and this is one of the things I want to talk about. We have two utility patents on our invention, and we have five industrial design registrations on the exact same invention in different countries. And some of them issue very quickly because it's just, you file it, you get it. And if that design is including traditional knowledge, genetic resources, traditional cultural expressions, that right gets issued. And the burden is then put on third parties to challenge that right. That is a choice that design law systems make to put the burden as opposed to having substantive examinations to make sh sure that the other requirements, novelty, originality, et cetera, are met before the right is granted. Okay? And if we're talking about indigenous peoples, local communities, or designers in countries where they're developing um, TCEs, TK, um, then they have that burden to challenge that right. So having the possibility of requiring the disclosure of origin of these types of cultural and genetic resources is important, particularly in design systems that so often do not involve substantive examination. Um, yeah, and the benefits as I was looking through it and having just recently gone through, in fact, we still have one design application pending, I don't see how this agreement would have made um, our lives as a small business um, much easier uh, in terms of getting design protection or reducing the cost. It was still thousands of dollars uh, to get protection um, in multiple countries. So another proposal that has been made 
is to have this disclosure provision in the regulations, not in the text of the treaty. And that, if it were agreed to, would likely lead to its demise very quickly. It is surprisingly easy to amend the regulations. Article 23.2 of the proposed DLT, any regulation can be amended with three quarters of the votes cast but a quorum is only one half of the member states of the assembly. So the regulations it appears could be amended by a vote of only a third of the contracting parties. Um, so if, and especially if you can imagine developing countries, many developing countries perhaps being slower to ratify this treaty, um, developing countries, developed countries jumping right in, they wanna get it enforced quickly, they are demanders for this, you could see that getting knocked out of those regulations really quickly. So again, not where you want it to be versus Article 26, this treaty may only be revised by a diplomatic conference. So if it's in the treaty, it's in there. If it's in the regulations, expect it to go away. All right, I'm not going to, uh, you all have seen these before. This relates more to T, K, and TCEs, which I think we're pretty much in agreement on, um, and that there are countries that already have requirements for disclosure of source and origin in relation to TK and TCEs. The question that has been coming up is, well, what about GRs and how do they relate and why should there be disclosure in a design treaty for genetic resources. Design only protects the appearance, it doesn't protect the material from which the article is made. So it doesn't matter, or does it? I think it does. All right, so registered designs do allow the owners to exclude the actual products whose appearance infringes the design. That product could be made from genetic resources acquired without the consent of the country or the people uh, who own those, okay? And an EU registered design actually does in, in Article 3, it says a design means the appearance of the whole or part of a product resulting from the features of, in particular, the lines, contours, color, shape, texture, and or materials of the product itself. That's the EU definition of a design. And as I said, design definitions of design differ quite a bit in, in national law. So that if we have the ability to require disclosure of origin of genetic resources, that can support compliance with the CBD and the Nagoya Protocol by providing information that could allow countries and IPLCs to determine if their resources have been used without permission or appropriate benefit sharing. Um, we should not cut off the ability for countries to inquire about genetic resources used in this way. And, and they're used in two ways, and I'm going to show you examples of both, um, used to actually give designs their appearance. They only have that appearance because particular genetic resources were used or used in the product that is being protected by this particular design right. I think I said it before, I will say it again, law tends to lag behind technology. We see this in the IGC in the topic of DSI, okay? And in the Nagoya Protocol and CBD, they'll be in, in Colombia in, in a couple of weeks. DSI, it's a huge issue and the multilateral benefit sharing mechanism. And it wasn't dealt with in Nagoya and technology has advanced and has made it really more important. So in the DLT, if we don't have the policy space to require disclosure of origin for genetic resources at the outset, you lose that ability, regardless of how technology advances in the future. Now, something that I, as I was thinking about this, I'm like, you know, a lot of people probably don't realize that there is a much closer link between utility patent protection and design protection than you probably realize. Um, I know this because I'm a patent attorney and back when I was in practice many years ago, um, I obtained patents for a large multinational paper company on toilet paper 
that was more absorbent. So utility patent on that, as well as design patents on the appearance of the pattern that actually affected that absorptive ability. There are a vast number of products that are protected by utility patents and also protected by design rights, okay? Because the utility patent protects the way something works, the design protects the appearance of an article of manufacture under US law or something that can be used industrially, okay? So that item probably has a function. And so oftentimes there can be protection for both. Um, and both types of protection provide exclusive rights that can prevent competition. So the same reasons that countries wanted the treaty adopted in May, the Treaty on IP Genetic Resources and Associated Traditional Knowledge are the reasons, same reasons, you might want to require disclosure of origin for genetic resources used in design applications. You might not want to reward genetic resource users who violate the ABS laws of your countries with either utility patent protection or design protection. So a very common example, um, my iPhone is around here somewhere, we'll grab this one. Um, it is protected with thousands of utility patents, but there are also very important design patents that cover it. And during the smartphone wars, um, of maybe a decade or so ago, Apple sued for both utility and design infringement. And in the US, designs are protected by patents, design patent, but it's, it's still like a, it's, it's our way of protecting industrial design rights. And the, the judgment was a billion dollars for infringement of the design rights. It was reduced on appeal, but nevertheless, and that got a lot of people's attention. People were like, ooh, designs matter. And, and so we see it much more interest. Now, this is a case that I teach in my patent law class. It's about an inventor who filed a US design application, then a Canadian design application, Canadian design patent issued. Then he filed, or design writer, forget what they call him in Canada. He filed a US utility patent application claiming priority to his design application. And the question for the court was, well, can a design application provide support for claims in a utility application? The court said, yes, it actually can. So this was, um, this is a design patent, an ornamental design for a double lumen catheter as shown and described. Design writes, it's a single claim just to the appearance of the article of manufacturing, you see the pictures. Well, guess what? Here's the utility patent. The pictures are basically the same. You just have all of these different lines and numbers because you're going to have the description in the utility patent of the things. But it's, it's the same. It's the same. Um, and the court said drawings alone can be sufficient to provide the written description. Whether the drawings are those of a design application or a utility application is not determinative. The design drawings are substantially identical to the utility patent drawings. The question is whether the drawings conveyed with reasonable clarity that Mahurka had invented the catheter. And if you can see that from the design drawings, that's enough. There are surprisingly lots of design patents on drugs, drug pills. I went into Google Patent and I put in drug and pill and medicine and pill or tablet. You can do it yourself. And just started looking, it was really interesting. So utility patents cover the drug composition, the method of making the drug, the method of using it, the dosing regimen. The design right protects the way it looks, giving additional protection beyond the utility patent. So here's an example of a design patent. And again, the ornamental design for a pharmaceutical tablet as shown and described. All that they are claiming is the way it looks, nothing about the way it works. And this gets into the dotted line question, okay? So you see the dotted line in the design um, drawing, the 10 is in dotted lines, which means it doesn't have to be 10, just something. And in the actual pill, it's 30. 
still protected, okay? Because they use dotted lines, they're not limited to the 10. Okay. Well, I had to do some digging because of course, the design patent doesn't say what drug it's for. Um, fortunately, drugs.com gives me the nice picture of a drug, tells me the name of the drug. I was then able to go into the FDA's orange book and find the utility patent on the drug, which would expire in 2028. Um, and so here's that patent, 7427638. Um, and the design patent would expire a year later because design patents go 14 years or now 15 years from the patent issue date, whereas utility patents go 20 years from the filing date. So design protection, it's good protection because it doesn't, the clock doesn't start until the patent issues, until the right issues. That's very nice. Um, in fact, I was just talking to the attorney who's prosecuting my application because our US design application has taken long. I'm like, it's taken a while. He's like, yeah, it is. He's like, there's nothing happening with it. I'm like, well, I'm not worried because the term clock won't start until it issues, so that's fine. Um, we have our utility patents, we're good. So if something happened to the utility patent, they would still have the design protection. But you may ask, if design rights only protect appearance, the drug could be made in a different pill shape and avoid infringement. That is true. But drug companies know the value of appearance. And so they don't want generics when that patent, utility patent expires to be able to come on the market with a pill that looks the same. Okay, if it looks the same, consumers are more likely to take it. In fact, there's data showing that the use of generics is limited among certain consumers because if the pill doesn't look the same, they don't think it doesn't work the same. It's not gonna be as good. It affects the likelihood of prescription error, lower medication adherence, contributes to the placebo effect. And so what we see are pharmaceutical companies protecting pill shapes, pill colors with trademarks, all of these kinds of things. So um, a country may not want to allow design protection on a drug product's appearance where the drug is based on genetic resources that were used in violation of ABS laws. As the drug company can benefit not only from the utility patent on the drug's function, but also design patents. So if you're requiring disclosure of origin of the genetic resources in the utility patent context, but you're still allowing them to get a design patent because you're not asking the question, seems like some inconsistency there. Let's take, to bring it a little closer to home, Captopril, the band name is Capelton, it's derived from the venom of the, venom of the Brazilian pit viper. Uh, folks noticed that when this viper would bite people, their blood pressure would drop precipitously and figured out what was in this venom um, and it created a new class of drugs, now the most commonly prescribed drugs for hypertension um, ACE inhibitors, angiotensin converting enzyme inhibitors used to treat more than 40 million people worldwide. Um, and you see, and now this was a long time ago. This was 1977, okay, when the utility patent issued. So no, they weren't thinking about design protection then. But they could have gotten a design patent on the appearance of that pill, Capitan. And when drug companies developed ACE inhibitor blood pressure drugs from Brazilian pit vipers, they sent little back to Brazil in terms of value. Okay. So you can have on the same product, utility patent protection and design patent protection. So if you care about genetic resources for utility patents, you should care about disclosure for design patents. All right, I'm not going to go through that. Um, and then, so these are examples of where the genetic resource actually is responsible for the appearance of the item. Um, now, some of these I showed you before, and then I got some new really cool ones. So this one, this jacket made from black textile waste and mushroom mycelium, which formed this white fungal network 
across the material to create a unique white pattern, that could be protected. That pattern could be protected. And it's, it only exists because the fungus grew in that particular formation. Okay. Um, lamp made from mushroom material, this beautiful 3D printed seat made from mushroom material, bio design. This one is so cool. This glass tube filled with octopus bacteria to create a zero electricity lamp that glows blue when disturbed. Um, nice lamp. Glad they have that, sure. The Ecovative Design uses mycelium to grow custom made packaging for various products. You could absolutely protect this under a utility patent as well as under design patent. Um, similarly, these lamps, uh, these floating color changing islands made of mycelium and bioengineered water hyacinths that indicate water health and filter polluted water. Certainly you could protect them with utility patents and you could also protect their appearance with design patents. Uh, hospital gown isolation waste disposal system made of fibers and starch based polymers of kumbungji, this Australian aquatic weed, utility patent, design patent, on the final product, the design patent you could, you could do. This one is really interesting. Um, this white pavilion, the design part is dictated by these silkworms, um, 6,500 silkworms were positioned on it and they filled it in in different ways. So the appearance is coming from the silkworms. And if the silkworms came from a particular country, you might wanna know that. Genetically engineered plant that emits light, creating a glowing otherworldly appearance, um, comparable in strength to starlight. You could get utility and design protection. Bees actively build upon a form, creating sculptures with the natural texture and shine of beeswax. So this looks like it looks because it's made out of beeswax. There was a lot that this in designer had to do. Isn't that amazing? I mean, it's, and he, he's got lots of different sculptures, but what if it required certain kind of bees that you only find, you know, in a particular country? Um, concrete uh, made from mixing a new type of materials, material so it's self-healing when it cracks, utility patent, and certainly design patents on the finished products. Fabric of textiles grown from bacteria and fungi, uh, glass, um, produced from mussels. Think of all of the different things that you can make with glass. Um, and if those mussels came not from the Great Lakes of the U.S., but from Lake Malawi, well, you might want to, you might want to know that. Um, textiles from sugarcane. Um, what if they, you know, genetically modified the sugarcane to do this, that, or the other? All of these things are inventions that could be protected with utility patents, and in many cases also with design. These you've seen before. So why so much resistance to Article 3, Alt-A? Well, the treaty that we just negotiated in May has a review clause in Article 8. The contracting parties commit to a review of the scope and contents of this treaty, addressing issues such as the possible extension of disclosure of the disclosure requirement in Article 3 to other areas of intellectual property. If Alt A is not in Article 3 of the DLT, you carve out designs from possible review. You're not going to even be able to look at it. Just gone. To need the policy space for getting to this review pr provision in four years and seeing whether it makes sense to have mandatory disclosure of origin. Again, DLT is just permissive. And in the draft traditional knowledge articles that yes, we'll be looking at in IGC 48 and 49 in December, there are four alternatives um, but one is intellectual property applications that would include design that concern any process or product that relates to or uses traditional knowledge shall include information on the country from which the applicant collected or received that knowledge. 
If Alt A is not in Article 3 of the DLT, you carve out designs from intellectual property in the draft TK document. Not going to even be able to consider it. So retaining Alt A in Article 3 is the clearest, safest choice to ensure policy space and cover future developments, both technological and treaty developments. All of the other options relates to eligibility, substantive, this, that, or the other, create ambiguity about whether disclosure of origin for GRs, TK, and TCs is actually allowed and create opportunities for pressure to be exerted on developing countries not to require it because it's unclear in the treaty whether you can really do it. And there's no reason to give way on this. This is permissive. This is not a mandatory requirement. It's just seeking policy space. So countries should have the policy space as the importance of design protection increases. And as we see it overlaps so often with utility patent protection to promote policy coherence by requiring disclosure of origin for genetic resources, biological resources, traditional knowledge and traditional cultural expressions in design applications. This should be in the text of the treaty, not the regulations, which can be much more easily amended. And the explicit inclusion of the words is important in Article 3 to avoid controversies about whether it's relevant to eligibility or not.